a chicken? <laughs> Did you say I dress up as a chicken? I dress up as a chicken if we get enough candy. All right. Just thought I'd hear that right. I kind of I kind of balk at that comment. Balk. Um, thank you so much, Bev, for sharing your testimony. Um, we're going through Romans here, and hopefully it will help you uh, really put into words why you believe that God has changed your life. It's giving, he's given us a new identity in Him. And we're in Romans chapter 5 today, so if you turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 5, we're going to look at the first 11 verses of Romans 5. I want to introduce it with a story. I, uh, years ago, went repelling for the first time. Years ago, I went repelling for the last time, first time and last time, same time, all right? And I had watched people go over the edge. I I can't remember. It's been so long ago. I don't know if I was with, I was a youth minister years ago. Might have been with the youth group. I had seen half of our group go over the edge, and I knew they were okay. And it was, then it became my turn. And so you you put on this harness, and and you have this, this caliper thing, what's it called? The ca- one of those s- carabiners. Yeah, the carabiners. And you put, you put that on with the rope, and the rope goes up, and it's tied off somewhere above you. Ours was tied off around the, the stump, a uh, tree stump, on the edge of this, this mountain. And it was about 20 to 30 feet up. So for, for, to understand how high that is, this is about 25 feet um, to the top of this in here. So... Um, so when you repel, you, you actually turn around with your back to the edge. I'm not going to do this as my edge because then it'd just be bad to turn that way to you guys. So let's have it back here. The edge is back here. And so the instructor said, now you need to like back towards the edge. And so you're holding onto the rope and you start backing towards the edge. And he said um, to everybody that was going on, going over the edge, he said, You have to, like, lean back and trust the rope. So I leaned back and trusted the rope, about like that. And he said, no, it'll be better for you if you fully trust in the rope, okay? So you can go down repelling a couple different ways, okay? And I'm not talking about either vertical or upside down. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about going down, you know, feet first, you can go down and you can enjoy it, or you could not enjoy it, okay? The more you trust in the rope and the equipment that you have around you, you'll actually enjoy it more. So I get to the edge, and he's like, now straighten your legs and really, really just lean out away from the mountain. This is against what you want to do. You don't want to do that. But there I was, scared of heights and all, I'm going to go over the edge, and I lean back, and I, and I put my feet out. Now, I haven't gone over yet. This is how long it took for me to go over. I get to the edge. I start leaning back, and, it's, and the, this noise is coming out of my body. It sounded like I was going to have a baby. <laughs> and I'm leaning into it. Now, I went over went down. A couple different ways you can do it. You can either enjoy it or not enjoy it. Those that didn't enjoy it and really lean into it, they would go down, but they would bang against the, bang against the side of the mountain as they went down because they, their feet weren't stretched out. Now, I want to use that illustration for us and our putting our faith in what God has done for us in Jesus. Okay? Because I think the more when you put your faith in something, it's going to affect your peace and joy. Okay, the more you put faith in Jesus, the more peace you're going to have and the more joy you will have. Okay, but if you don't trust that Jesus did all the work on the cross, your peace will go and your joy will go. They'll go out the window and you'll live your Christian life not having peace and not having joy. You might put on the you might put on the smile and everything's good cuz that's what you do when you come to church everything's good okay but deep down inwardly you may know that you don't have peace my faith affects my peace and joy God, for instance god tells us like take a sabbath day off take a day off during the week 
You know, you're going to lean into what God has to say and enjoy the fact that He made that for you. Or are you going to cling to, no, it's not me that provides. It's not God that provides. It's me that provides. And so you, you kind of lean into, I probably should take some time away and, and remind myself that it's God and not me. Or maybe we just don't put our faith in God. And that could be a multiple of things. Whatever God asks us to do in the Bible or not do, it's for our good. It's for our good. It's for our benefit. But there are multiple things that we would say, no, 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 I'll determine what's right and wrong, and I'll determine what I should do and shouldn't do. And really leaning into God is a whole different story. If you really have your faith in God and what He did for you on the cross, you can have peace and joy. But most of us often don't. Look at Romans chapter 5, verse 1. It says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, Justified, just as if I'd never sinned. How so? By my faith, by believing, by putting my full trust in it. It's God who has saved me, not I'm not saving myself. It's God. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what's, now we get the word therefore. We ask, what's the therefore? Therefore. The therefore goes back to Mike's sermon last week where he talked about there's a God who is wrathful. He gets upset when things are not, when people don't treat each other right, when, when we harm ourselves by things we think, oh, that's okay for me. But God's like, I created you. It's not good for you. He gets angry at that because he wants the best for us, and he doesn't want us to treat people with ill intent and hurt each other. So he, there's justice. We want justice. So there's the wrath of God, but then there's also this love of God that's like, I love you so much that I'm going to send my son Jesus to pay the price for your sin. And so we see the cross, and we got the wrath of God, and we've got the love of God coming down for all mankind. And all of us find ourselves there with the wrath of God, but boy, because of Jesus, we don't have the wrath of God. What we do have is all these great things he has for us. And this is where Paul's going to get into here, Romans 5, verses 1 to 11. And we're learning about, I can, this is who I can be in Christ. I'm finding my identity in in not my, not my gender, not my race, not my sexuality, not my occupation, not anything else. It is found in Jesus and who he created me to be. That's first. All that other stuff needs to flow out of what God says about those things. My sexuality, my gender, my all that stuff comes out of what God has, is saying of me in Jesus according to God's word. Okay? So we're learning about our identity and we're no longer objects of wrath and and Paul is saying, therefore, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, now we can have this peace of God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Look at verse 2. Through him we've also maintained, obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So I'm going to talk about, and the, write this down, this is your next point. My peace comes from my confidence in God's grace. Being confident in it. So you can go back to the rope illustration. I'm I'm going to repel off this. I'm going to enjoy this process. Well, if the rope is grace, and I know it's it's God who gives it to me, not because I worked for it, but because of his love for me, then I can have full confidence in that. Okay? Then I'll have peace. Ah. I won't sound like I'm having a baby going over the edge, right? (laughs) And some of us hang on to our Christianity like that. I missed church last week. I didn't sign up for the fourth Bible study this week, you know. I mean, how much do you need to do in order to get God to love you? Peace comes from a confidence in God's grace. And this talks about standing in it. That's where I get the word confidence. My peace comes from standing in God's grace. And I believe that's a confidence that we can have. Now, this word peace, it means this. And if you know, if there's some st- st- scholars in here, Irene is the Greek word, a condition of freedom from an inward disturbance or outward. But I'm going to talk about inward peace because you can show up and go, 
People say, how you doing? Fine. Things are good. Things are good. And then when no one's around, you're not at peace. You got, you got to fill it with all kinds of things. You can't rest. There's no rest. I'm talking about an inward peace, a condition of freedom from disturbance, whether outwardly or inwardly, as a, in a, as a nation from war or enemies, or inwardly, freedom from disturbance in the soul, deep within you, when no one else is around, when no one's looking. See, why do we turn to those things that are not of God? Oftentimes, it's because we have no peace. We're trying to fill it. We've got to fill it with something. And so it's this inner, inner peace, free from disturbance within me. It's the same word that they used in, in the Old Testament or the Jews. They would use shalom. Only that's just not, they're not saying, hey, how you doing? Or bye. Shalom is this wishing you to be brought to wholeness. We are brought to wholeness when we find our peace in the grace that comes through Jesus. And then we can have this, and it's found in the grace, confident grace, and we stand in it knowing full well God has forgiven us. My sins now, my sins in the future, He's given me His Holy Spirit as a guarantee that I will be in heaven. Oh, I can have peace when I have confidence in that. But you know, <laughs> have you heard it this way? Grace is unmerited favor, okay? Let me, let me explain it a little this way. In the scouts, you, you, get, you get some badges. What are they called? They're called merit badges, right? Yeah, called merit badges. And so you, you join the scouts, and you're like, man, I want some merit badges, all right? I want one for archery, and I want for, one for science, and I want one for the... And so you walk up to your scout master, whatever they're called. I wasn't in, I wasn't in scouts, okay? It'll become obvious probably in this, as I tell this. Anyway, I want, I want a merit badge. And they're like, well, did you do the work? Is it verified? Well, no, I just want it. Well, you can't have it. You got to earn it. It's not an unmerited badge. It's a merit badge, all right? So when it comes to grace from God, it is some, not something that you earn. It's something that is given. It's given to you. But, but we don't often see it that way. I, I wonder what it would look like if we walked into church next week and we wore our, all of our spiritual badges, our spiritual merit badges. Like and we had... I've been going to church here for 15 years. How about you? I'm in, you got another patch. I'm in four Bible studies a week. Match that. You know? I've not missed church for the last five weeks. And I volunteer in four different ministries in this church. Well, why didn't you volunteer for the fifth one? What's your, what's your problem? You'd get a different badge if you did it for the fifth one. So, and I'm talking about a, an inner peace that we often don't have because we don't know how many badges we need to get. And so people will make a comment like, well, how come you weren't this or how come you didn't do that? And, that? and it feeds that. And it's all throughout our churches. And pastors and ministers can actually put their thumb on it and push that button to get you to do more. Unless, unless you understand that this grace comes from not what you do, but it's given to you through Jesus Christ. So when you put your full trust in that, and you, you, you go through those difficult times and you lean in, to the grace that comes from God alone. You can have confidence in it and you can stand in it. And, and Paul is saying to these Christians in Rome, he's saying, you can stand in it. We've got it through access. We've accessed it by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice. And so Jesus came, comes along and he would say things like, um, 
I'm giving you peace. I'm giving you real peace. Look, listen to this from John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Anybody want a life that's at peace with God and peace with themselves? And as much as you can have peace with others, you have that? <laughs> See, Jesus came to give us a real peace, not a peace that's just wished upon. Well, I shouldn't have any guilt, so I should just be peaceful. Or I should wish it upon myself and cross my kind of sit in an Indian style. Or how do you sit? Like, what's it called? And, and you get your hands up and you're like, mm. we've got peace. We've ignored life, but we have peace. Listen, if you don't have peace through Jesus with the Creator, You'll never have real peace because God created you. He wanted you to have peace, and He sent His Son, Jesus, so that you could have that. Until we have that, we are not people that have peace. We, we, we can't just tell people, well, just don't be upset about things. Man, why, you should just be tolerant about everything, and then we'll have peace if nobody gets upset at one another. And Jeremiah has put it this way. It won't be on the screen, but Jeremiah 6.14 says, They've healed the wound of my people lightly. Just saying, peace, peace, when there isn't real peace. Do you get me? Do you understand what I'm talking about? Like, true peace that comes from, I have a right relationship with God because of Jesus. And I can be confident in that because it comes through grace. There is no real, true inner peace unless there is peace between us and God, and we have that through Jesus. We can have that through Jesus. Look at verse 3. Not only that, but we, we rejoice in our sufferings. This is an amazing part of this section of Scripture. Yeah, how can you have peace when you're going through tough times? It says, not only that, will we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance, endurance produces character, character produces hope, and hope doesn't put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that's been given to us. So we have peace. Not only peace, but we have joy. If you're trying to earn, earn your religion, earn your way into heaven, peace and joy will be the first two things to go. Because you know you don't really measure up. And sometimes you get frustrated that life's not working out for you. God, why is this? Man, I'm following you. I'm trying to do everything right. Joy goats out the window if you don't understand this is the next point. My joy comes from finding purpose in my suffering. My joy comes from purpose. Thank you, Sermon Club. It was great this last Monday. Two o'clock Monday afternoons, we get together. Anybody can come, and we just study this out together. I'm like, man, okay, I'm wrestling with that. They're like, it's, we have joy because it, there's purpose in what we're going through. I, uh, I'm not going to say which, which of my kids. I'm going to try to just say, um, I'm trying not to use one of their names, okay? So you don't know which kid it is, all right? I got all the way through at first service and then messed it up at the end, but we'll, we'll see if we can do it, okay? One of our kids wanted to not work, okay? Their senior year. Don't look at each other down here. Don't, I saw, I saw what was going on down here. Don't look at each other, okay? Don't. He might not, he might not even be here. He might be at Bible College in, in Missouri, okay? It might be Josh, all right? Okay. Don't do that. So this child of ours calls us, or no, this child of ours says, I don't want to work my senior year because they wanted to join some extracurricular activity after school. We said, you know what? That's okay, but you're going to run out of money. And when you run out of money from the job that you had, you're going to wish that you had that money. And you're not going to be able to do the things your friends are doing. Sure enough, a couple months later, this child of ours calls. My wife picks up the phone, and I'm not going to get this right, but this is close, okay? Mom, I don't have any more money. And I was, maybe it was gas money for this child's car. Or they couldn't go do what they wanted to do. And I remember, so proud of my wife. My wife listened. She said, uh-huh, uh-huh, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. Goodbye. Click.
This child didn't feel any joy. There was no rejoicing in this child's sufferings. Okay? But there's something, there's something that a mom and dad know. A lot of mom and dads don't know this these days. Okay? I hope you do. I hope you're one of those. That the suffering that they may endure for a short time will lead to endurance, which leads to character, which can lead to hope. And there's no shame in hoping in Jesus. Okay, so you see that pattern? Suffering that we go through leads to endurance. This child, when they got a job finally, you don't have to talk to this child and go, you need to keep working. This child learned how to endure because they went through suffering. Don't miss that. Just because you're a child of God and you're like, oh, I finally have peace and joy and hey, this leads to understanding that as a child of God, you're going to go through suffering. Joy is not, I'm happy all the time. This is an inward peace knowing, knowing that God is with you and for you, wants what's best for you, and it'll lead to endurance. And you'll train up kids in the way that they will go, and when they're old, they will not depart from it. Okay? This is no fun, parents. No fun between whatever age and whatever age. It's not fun. Okay? But, but you, are, you are helping them understand a biblical concept in the Bible that through their sufferings, they'll learn how to endure. And in their enduring, they will learn character. Okay? They'll develop a moral, the moral standard. They'll, inner, they'll have inner moral strength. That's what it leads to. These sufferings that produce endurance, that produce kids and adults with moral strength. And then the hope is in Jesus and what He has for us here, not only here, but the life to come. It's why James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4 says, Consider it pure joy, brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you might be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Who doesn't want their kids to lack anything? Uh, I don't want them to lack anything. Well, I'm going to... I'm going to allow them to go through some suffering, okay? I'm going to help them learn how to endure. So Paul goes right into this. Not only do we have peace and joy, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that it's going to lead to some. What we're going through, we find purpose in it as Christians. Man, we've got so many, so many um, people going into relationships with one another and neither one, I'm talking about marriage right now for just a second. We go, we, we think we're ready for marriage. We haven't gone through anything tough. Our parents didn't allow us to go through sufferings. And then you put those two people together and neither one have learned how to endure because marriage sometimes is enduring suffering. It is sometimes. And then there's moral, then there's moral failure. You heard of that, Okay. That's not good character. You see that? Sufferings lead to endurance, which lead to character, moral strength. Man, this is so rich, guys. This is, look at verse 6. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. This is where you learn this stuff and you take this into relationships. Man, and relationships can last for a while. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps, though perhaps a good person one would dare to even die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, neither righteous nor good. You see the progression he's talking about? Righteous person, good person, that's none of us. Sinner. That's, how, that's where he goes. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have been justified by his blood, how much more will we be saved from the wrath of God? Because of Jesus. See, there's the wrath of God showing up. But I thought he loves us. He loves us so much he had wrath come down on Jesus. Verse 10. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more. Now that we are reconciled, reconciled as there's a problem between two parties and it's been made right. 
Shall we be saved by His life? More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Look at verse 6. While we were still weak. Verse 6 says, Paul regards weakness as ungodliness. Not, not being weak as being ungodly, but being ungodly is a weak person. Oh, come on, man. You won't join us in this, man. You're not a man. You're not, you know, you, you, should, you should do these things. You're not of God. They wouldn't say not of God, but you're like, those aren't of God. And they think it's cool and they think it's, I've grown up because I'm starting to do these things that are not of God. No, the Bible says you are a weak person. It takes much more moral strength to stand up and say, no, I'm not going to go that way. I'm not going to do those things. But the Bible says here, in that while we were weak and ungodly, God did something for us. He said, I'm going to send Jesus because I love you that much. God was not indifferent about sin. He did something about sin. And so it's interesting, just Paul is saying, you are not a person because when we're caught up in self and serving self, we don't think about others. We run over, we run over people. I'm just going to do my own thing. Well, you know what? You're not a very strong person. Matter of fact, that's pretty weak. You're not other-centered. You're centered on yourself, and then you become a slave to sin, and you're busy at what benefits you. And then our identity becomes wrapped up in us and what makes us feel better about who we are. The Bible actually wants us to feel bad about who we are because we're sinners. And then we get Jesus, and then because of Jesus we feel good about who we are. Did you follow that? We got to feel bad first. There's a sin problem that needs to be dealt with first. And then, while we were weak, God sends Jesus. And then we find our value in that. That's my last point. My value is determined by God's love for me. Let me illustrate it this way. Um, in Sermon Club, I, this, is, this, next, this verse I want to focus in on is, is a tough one. The whole if very rarely someone will die for a righteous person, though for a good person they might die. I asked the sermon club, I'm like, man, I, I'm, having, I'm wrestling with that, I always have. They said, Tim, how about uh, a secret service, a person that works in the secret service? You know anybody that works in the secret service? You do. You may not know it because it's no longer a secret. I can put his picture up, okay? Not, it's not a, it wasn't even a secret when he was working, okay? This is Bob Harrell. He's one of our elders here. And everybody I'd run into when he was still working at Secret Service at the church was like, oh, yeah, the guy in the Secret Service. Wasn't a secret, Bob. <laughs> but anyway, he's still traveling, so we're going to talk about him. No, but I called him. I called him this week and said, Bob, explain to me this whole Romans chapter 5, verse uh, 7 verse. He said, Tim, most people think that the Secret Service are there to protect just the important people. And I'm like, yeah, I've called you before, and you've been protecting the first lady. I've called you before, and you were like, I, I've been on the phone with him. He's like, I just got done, you know, and he shares these stories. I'm like, that's what Secret Service do. He says, no, Secret Service are there to protect anybody and everybody. Their first job is this person of importance, but they will die for anybody. And here's one of the reasons why. Do you think that all the Secret Service agree with every political view that's out there and every person they're guarding? Do you know that they have to guard people that come in from other countries? They're put on detail because they don't want something happening to a foreign um, president or prince or on our, on our soil. On our, they, they don't want that to happen, so they're, they're having to guard all these people that don't, they don't agree with. So maybe for a righteous person, a person of well importance, somebody might die for them, maybe. Maybe for someone a little bit less important. But for us that are all sinners, no way. And I'm like, Bob, how do you, how do you get that mindset? And Bob said, you know, if I were to take a bullet for somebody, I know where I'm going but I'm not sure they know where they're going after they die. And I was like, whoa. 
This is the type of love that God has for all people. He knows where we're all going because we're all sinners. We need the blood of Jesus. He created a way to get to heaven. But God demonstrates His own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And then God wants us to treat each other with the same type of love that He has for us. Oh, man, it, it just it changes a lot of things. And Paul ends this, chap, this section, verse 11, the same way he began it, talking about where you're justified by faith and it's through, through Jesus. Um, I want to go through verse, verse, I want to go to verse 9. It's not going to be on the screen, but listen. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, he stepped in front and took the punishment for us, okay? Took the bullet for us in a sense. But God showed His love for us in that while we're still Verse 9, since therefore we have now been justified by His blood, much more shall we be saved by, saved by Him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, while we were enemies, we were reconciled. We didn't make ourselves right. Colossians 1.21 says this, And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, we were once that way. God says, I still love you. I'll still take the punishment. I'll forgive you. What do we do with our enemies? What are you going to do with your enemies now? Now that we know we can have peace and joy, and what about our enemies now? A reporter was interviewing an old man on his 100th birthday. What are you most proud of? He asked the 100-year-old man. He says, well, I don't have an enemy in the world. What a beautiful thought. That's inspirational, said the reporter. Yep, said the centurion, 100 years old, outlived every last one of them. <laughs> well, what about your enemies? Do you, are you an enemy of God? An enemy of God is one that's against His purposes, against His will. And God's like, you know what? Even though they're against my will, I'm going to show them through my love that they need a Savior. So here's a few decisions to make today. There's three different decisions you can make. You can pick one of them or you might need a couple of them, okay, depending on where you're at in your life. The first one is this. Will I surrender my life to Jesus? If you look at the beginning of Romans chapter 1, verses 22 to 32, you'll see a whole list of godless living. And you look at that list and you're like, mm, I'm in there. I need, I need a Savior. So maybe you need to surrender your life to Jesus. Say, God, I'm sorry. I want you to lead my life. And I'd love to talk with you. I'll be in the back corner over here. Um, you can mark on your card in front of you. There's a decision card there. You can drop it in the boxes around the room. Will I surrender my life to Jesus? The second one's this. Will I give grace to those who are my enemies? God, I'm confident. Thank you for the peace and joy you give me. But man, I'm suffering right now, and there's pe some people in my life that, that are my enemies. And God has given us grace, and He's asked us to give that grace to those who are our enemies. Maybe it's the first two. Maybe it's this one. And this is the one I, I probably struggle with the most, and that's the confidence that God's grace is enough. The confidence of grace that I can stand in and say, God, thank you. Thank you for forgiving me, for loving me, and showing me that you love me. So what will it be? Let's pray. God, thank you for your work in our lives, and God, help us to to lean out away from the struggles and the problems and lean into the grace, the strength, the forgiveness that you have for us on the cross. And then, Lord, help us extend that to others. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to take communion, and communion is a time to focus on what God has done for you and me so that his wrath came, came down on us. No, it came down on the cross so that he can show his love 
for those around us and also us. So think about taking other people to that cross, your enemies. What would Jesus do for them?